Scorched earth, twisted metal, and eerie silence. Across the globe, there are sights that whisper of otherworldly encounters, places where the impossible seems to have touched down. We're venturing into the heart of these disturbing crash sites, where the wreckage of unidentified flying objects remains a chilling reminder that we may not be alone in the universe. Prepare to explore the mysteries that defy conventional explanations and ignite the imagination. And we're gonna start things off with Point Doom Underwater Base. So off the coast of Point Doom in Malibu, there seems to be this mysterious structure lying about six miles underwater. Images captured on Google Earth show an oval-shaped object resting on the seabed floor. Looks like it has a large flat top and what seems to be pillars or columns. But looking at it, it definitely looks like the entrance to something. It sits about 2,000 feet beneath the ocean surface, spanning nearly three miles in width, and some speculate that it could be more than just a naturally formed structure. And yes, some even think it could be an underwater alien base. Jimmy Church, who hosts a California-based radio show called Fade to Black, was pretty excited about the images, stating, my first impression was that it was Greek. It looked artificial and didn't look natural. When you're looking at it from above, it's a nearly perfect oval shape. In the natural surroundings, nothing is symmetrical. Everything is eroded and covered in rocks and sloping and peaking. And right here for two miles, it is a perfect oval with a black separation or outline to it. It just stands out that it has to be some type of roof. It's not on like a dome stadium or a covered indoor racetrack or an Olympic arena. It's got that feel to it. It looks like a perfect oval man-made structure sitting on a construction site. Next up, we have the Solomon Islands UFOs. There have been some very strange things said to go on here for hundreds and hundreds of years. And not only have locals claimed to see strange lights in the sky, but also coming up from under the water as well, which has led to a pretty intense theory that there could be an underwater alien base there. There have always been local legends of monstrous giants on the islands, 10 foot tall hairy creatures with flat noses and glowing red eyes. That combined with the reports of strange lights in the sky, moving with incredible speed and agility could mean there may be some kind of connection here. You see, some of these lights and strange flying objects have been seen descending down into the trees of the Guadalcanal or rising up from the ocean and zipping around before diving back down. There are also legends that these giants that are said to live on the island move around through subterranean tunnels. So some speculate that beneath the surface of the ocean is this hidden structure where extraterrestrial beings may be conducting their activities. Next up, we have High Brazil, a small mythological island off the coast of Ireland. According to Celtic folklore, this island is said to lie off the west coast of the country, appearing only every seven years, usually surrounded by mist. The island is often described as a paradise with advanced technology and a society living in total harmony with nature. Sailors and explorers have reported spotting the island for centuries, claiming to have seen strange creatures and these glowing god-like beings there. Maps from the 14th to the 19th centuries often included Hype Brazil, but its exact location was always a bit of a mystery. Now, now, of course, it sounds like complete folklore, which Celtic culture is absolutely full of, but what if there's something else going on here? Well, some have suggested that the islands appearing and disappearing could have an extraterrestrial connection. The idea is that aliens could be using advanced cloaking technology or have a hidden base on or beneath the island. And the mysterious creatures that some sailors claimed to have seen on the island do sound like they could be alien-like, but it's still a total mystery as to what they'd be doing over there. Next up on the list, we have strange skulls that were found in an underwater cave in Mexico. So in 2012, divers were exploring a cenote in the Yucatan Peninsula where they came across two chambers full of human bones and some of these bones were human skulls but there was something off about them they were elongated now the ancient Maya were said to have performed human sacrifices in the area and skull deformation was also practiced in various parts of Mexico way way back when there are theories as to why but nothing entirely concrete one idea is that high-ranking members of society had elongated skulls some say that people's skulls were elongated just to defend differentiate certain groups 
from one another, but there's also the theory that these skulls never belonged to human beings at all. Pretty common knowledge, of course, that there are tons of conspiracy theories surrounding the ancient Maya, including the presence of extraterrestrials. That may have helped them construct all their intricate advanced cities. So could these skulls have belonged to these supposed alien beings? It's possible. Next up, we have the Lake Bacal incident. So uh, this lake in southern uh, Siberia is the world's largest freshwater lake by volume. It's incredibly deep. And there are some pretty eerie stories about it. First of all, there's all the mysterious lights that are reported, not just hovering or flying above it, but also coming from the depths of the water. And there's a very creepy story that was supposedly an, an attempted cover-up by the Russian government. So in 1982, a team of Navy divers were doing a routine diving exercise in the lake when a number of them started spotting something pretty disturbing. There were all these figures deep under the water. They were tall and slender, well over six feet tall, and wearing what looked to be silver suits. Those suits could have also been silvery scales. They also had large, circular, glowing, unblinking eyes. The creatures began chasing after the divers, or swimming after them, rather, and the divers panicked and then swam back up to the surface and they reported what they'd seen to their superiors, but that's where the story ends. The existence of the strange creatures has never been confirmed or denied. Next up, we have underwater alien bases in Alaska. So claims of alleged alien bases lurking beneath the waters off the coast of Alaska have been around for quite a while, but in recent years, the idea of them has become more of a popular thing, mostly thanks to ancient aliens. Thank you, ancient aliens. But apparently, there are even eyewitness accounts dating back several decades, which have been mostly undisclosed until recently. UFOlogy and UFO enthusiasts have now been turning their attention to the mysterious activities in the waters of Alaska. One incident dates back to 1945 when crew members of a ship reported spotting an unidentified craft. Researchers, including members of MUFON, or the Mutual UFO Network, which is a nonprofit organization that studies reported UFO sightings, they think it's possible that extraterrestrial beings have been constructing bases beneath the ocean's surface. And that's because because there are tons of reports of UFO movements over the water. There were also a number of UFO sightings in the 40s that weren't disclosed to the public at the time. These undisclosed reports allegedly provide evidence that there are extraterrestrial entities operating in the waters off the coast of Alaska. This next story comes to us from Reddit, and although what this person saw wasn't technically under the water, it was floating just above it, and it's a pretty fascinating account. The story comes to us from user Keslo, who writes, I used to live in Charleston, South Carolina back around 2006, and I had a job that had me leaving home at about 4 a.m. I lived in a bad part of town near the International Airport Joint Base, so when I left, I did a scan of the area before getting into to my car. One morning I stepped out of my home to do my scan and noticed that there were thin wispy clouds flowing in off the ocean. Basically it was a thin fog about a thousand to fifteen hundred feet up moving like a river. I also noticed at this point that there were two effing moons. One is obscured by the thin clouds, our real moon, and the other is most definitely under the clouds. It was a sphere of glowing white light. It made no sound and did not move. After about two minutes, it bolted eastward towards the ocean. The glowing light faded quickly right as it took off as well. I've seen planes move near the speed of sound and this thing went from zero to like 3,000 miles per hour instantly. No acceleration. Much, much faster than the speed of sound with no sonic boom. I hope I don't see it again, especially on the water. I always wondered if it bolted because they saw me watching them. Next up, we have the strange reports of a large disc-like object being spotted in the Indian Ocean. Apparently as far back as 1873, ships sailing the Indian Ocean from the Persian Gulf to the South China Sea have reported spotting a massive mile-wide disc passing uh, beneath their boats, accompanied by large, like, rotating lights. One of the earliest documented sightings happened on March 
23rd of 1873 when the ship Adelaide traversed the South China Sea. Witnesses reported floating over a huge glowing circular object beneath the ocean's surface. On May 15, 1879, the crew of the HMS Vulture described the sighting of two large Ferris wheels spinning in opposite directions. The spokes of these wheels were reported to be 25 feet wide with 100 feet of space between them. There have been tons of these reports in various locations in the Indian Ocean you know, over the years. On April 4th, 1901, for example, in the Persian Gulf, the crew of the SS Kilwa claimed to see rays of light emanating from an underwater disc-like object. And even in 1943, in the Persian Gulf, a sailor named Matthew Mangle reported a huge glowing disc beneath the water's surface pacing his ship. And these are just a handful of examples. And coming in at second place is the Michigan Stonehenge. So in 2007, a professor of underwater archeology, span Mark Hawley, made a pretty incredible discovery. It was this arrangement of stones lying on the lake bed, looking a lot like Stonehenge in England. The stones are laid out in a circular pattern and some even appear to be arranged in a line. They're about 40 feet below the surface of the lake. So what was the purpose of this formation? Could it be the remnants of an ancient civilization? Could extraterrestrials have constructed it thousands of years ago? They look like they've been placed in a pretty precise pattern. Doesn't look to be natural uh, forming to me. And uh, of course, there's also a rock with a mastodon carved into it. Uh, hard to believe something like that would be created naturally. What's also really fascinating is that these stones are believed to be about 9,000 years old, predating Stonehenge by about 4,000 years. And finally, it's only natural that we finish things off with what has to be the most famous strange object discovered deep beneath the sea, the Baltic Sea Anomaly. So back in the summer of 2011, a team of Swedish treasure hunters didn't come across any treasure in terms of monetary gain anyway, but they did find something pretty cool, a sonar image that seems to show a strange UFO-like object on the sea floor. Peter Lindbergh, the leader of the treasure hunting team, would be so awesome just to be able to say you're the leader of a treasure hunting team. I could say that and I'd just be like digging through my backyard finding nothing. But this guy actually goes out on boats and submarines and does it. I didn't get that job. Anyway, he's the leader of Ocean X and was pretty astonished by what he had found, saying the object definitely didn't look like a natural formation. And even though a number of researchers have come out and said it probably is a natural formation, I still get excited looking at this thing. I don't know, I'm just not entirely convinced. I'm on the fence about this one. But what do you guys think? Alien, craft, ancient artifact, just some mundane natural formation? Let us know down in them comments. Spot, we have the 1976 Tehran incident. The 1976 Tehran UFO incident is a notable case in UFOlogy that took place on September 19th, 1976. The incident involved a luminous object that was observed hovering over the city by two F-4 Phantom II jet interceptors of the Iranian Air Force. The object was detected on radar and appeared to be capable of jamming the communication systems of the jets. The pilots reported that they saw a brightly lit diamond-shaped object that emitted a green light and they attempted to engage it with missiles. However, the object evaded their attempts and quickly disappeared. At a pilot's conference in 2007, one of the pilots in this incident, Parviz Jafari, said he attempted to fire at the UFO, but something strange was preventing him from doing so. He said, quote, my weapons jammed and my radio communications garbled. The incident was investigated by the Iranian government and the US Defense Intelligence Agency, and it has been the subject of much speculation and debate among UFO enthusiasts. Some argue that the incident was evidence of extraterrestrial activity, while others suggest it may have been a secret military experiment or some kind of atmospheric phenomenon. Despite the official investigation, the incident remains unresolved and its true nature remains a mystery. In our number 9 spot today, we have the McMinnville UFO photographs. The McMinnville UFO photographs are a series of two photographs taken by Paul and Evelyn Trent on May 11th, 1950 in McMinnville, Oregon. The photos depict a metallic disc-shaped object in the sky with trees and buildings visible 
in the foreground. The Trents claimed that they saw the object hovering in the sky and were able to capture it on camera. The photographs quickly gained widespread attention and were widely circulated in newspapers and magazines, and they were also examined by several experts, including the US Air Force, which conducted an investigation known as Project Blue Book. Famous, famous project here on Most Amazing Top 10. The Trents maintained that the photographs were genuine and that they had not tampered with them in any way. However, some skeptics have suggested that the photographs may have been hoaxed or that the objects in the photographs were just a common object. Despite the controversy surrounding the photographs, however, they remain one of the most famous and well-known UFO sightings in history. The photographs have been the subject of numerous articles, books, and documentaries, and have inspired countless discussions and debates about the existence of UFOs and extraterrestrial life. In our number 8 spot today, we have the USS Nimitz Tic Tac UFO incident. This UFO sighting comes from 2004. On November 14th of that year, the USS Princeton noticed an unknown aircraft of some sort that was about 100 miles off of the coast of San Diego. For two weeks prior to this, the crew had been tracking a strange flying object that would start out at about 80,000 feet before extremely quickly dropping to hover right above the Pacific Ocean. Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Jim Slate went over in two fighter jets and when they arrived, they saw what at first appeared to be churning water while there was an oval shape just below the surface. After this, the white oval shaped object appeared above the water, but it had no markings on it. Like no windows, nothing that would indicate an engine, no wings, and the infrared monitors on the jets didn't pick up any sort of exhaust. The commander and lieutenant commander tried to intercept this strange aircraft, but it very quickly flew away and reappeared on the monitor 60 miles away. And when I say quickly, I mean it was moving at three times the speed of sound and over twice the speed of the fighter jets. So, faster than any kind of technology we currently have. We still don't know exactly what it was, but it certainly was beyond our current capabilities. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Aguadilla Airport Incident. The Aguadilla Airport UFO incident occurred on April 25th, 2013, when a strange object was spotted hovering above the Rafael Hernandez Airport in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. The object was initially detected by radar and later confirmed by security cameras as a glowing, unidentified object that appeared to be traveling at a low altitude. The object was described as being around 4 to 5 feet in length and it moved very quickly and very erratically. It was also observed to emit a bright white light and appeared to be changing shape. The incident attracted widespread attention and was investigated by several government agencies, including the Federal Aviation Administration and the Department of Homeland Security. The object was ultimately classified as an unidentified flying object, or UFO, and no explanation was given for its presence in the area. It is even said that a US Customs and Border Protection aircraft actually captured infrared video of the incident that was given to the Scientific Coalition for UFOlogy by a whistleblower. This video is said to show the UFO traveling at super low altitudes, sometimes lower than the treetops, but at speeds close to 100 miles per hour. The Aguadilla Airport UFO incident is considered one of the most significant UFO sightings in recent history due to the high level of documentation and the involvement of government agencies. It continues to be a topic of discussion and speculation among UFO enthusiasts and researchers and has contributed to ongoing efforts to uncover the truth about the nature and origin of UFO sightings around the world. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Project Blue Book sighting. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Richard French was once tasked with being an investigator for Project Blue Book, which was the name used to describe a study of UFOs conducted by the United States Air Force from March 1952 to December 17, 1969, when the project was terminated. Okay, we talk about Project Blue Book a lot. You gotta know what it is. While his job was meant to be to investigate and essentially debunk UFO sightings, later in life he took to Congress to stand up and explain his own UFO encounter that he was never able to explain away. The moment that truly stuck with him all of these years took place back in 1952 when he was sent off to Newfoundland after there were reports of a UFO that had crashed off of the coast of St. John's. As he arrived to the scene, there were at least 100 people who all stood and stared into the water, and as he was able to follow their gaze and see what they were all looking at, he couldn't quite believe his eyes. He recalled the water being quite clear, and under it you could see two circles 
circular crafts, each one approximately 18 feet in diameter. He said that they were both floating just below the surface of the water, no more than 20 feet from the shore. And not only this, but he could also see two beings with the crafts. He said, quote, the first thing I saw was the UFOs, and it was apparent to me that they were doing something to the craft, and I couldn't really tell what, because they were on the bottom side of it and not visible to me, except when they would occasionally get over to the side where I could see them. He claims he watched on as the beings worked on the craft until one of them raised out of the water and disappeared, but not before accelerating to speeds in the neighborhood of 2,500 to 3,000 miles per hour. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Coin Mansfield helicopter incident. The Coin Mansfield helicopter UFO incident occurred on October 18, 1973, when four members of the Ohio Army National Guard were flying in a helicopter over Mansfield, Ohio. Suddenly, they encountered a large metallic disc shaped object that was hovering in the sky. The object began to move towards the helicopter, causing the crew to take evasive maneuvers. Despite their efforts, the object continued to follow them, eventually passing overhead and disappearing into the distance. The crew reported the incident to their superiors, and an investigation was launched by the military and the Federal Aviation Administration. The incident received significant media attention, and it remains one of the most compelling UFO sightings on record. What makes this incident particularly intriguing is the credibility of the witnesses. The crew were all experienced pilots with military training, and their account of the incident was corroborated by radar data and other witnesses on the ground. Despite extensive investigations, no satisfactory explanation has ever been offered for what they saw that day. In our number 4 spot today, we have Apollo 11. So we can sit here on Earth all day and talk about the potential for alien life and UFOs, but who would know more than the people who have actually been to space, which are of course astronauts. Definitely on the list of coolest and scariest jobs in the world, there haven't been a ton of people who have had the unbelievable privilege of experiencing space firsthand, but there are even less of them who have claimed to see something that seems completely unexplainable. People who have claimed these sorts of things include Edgar Mitchell, Catherine Coleman, and Dr. Brian O'Leary. The very interesting part about many of these claims is that they also include some sort of government cover-up as well with their claims. There was also Buzz Aldrin, who spoke about his Apollo 11 experience, and he detailed the crew seeing something flying alongside them, and at first, they believed it was the final stage of a detached rocket, but then Mission Control confirmed that it was actually 6,000 miles away from them, leaving them with no answers on what the flying object could be. I can't imagine going to space at all, let alone encountering a UFO flying right beside you. Also, I can't believe that I hadn't heard of that story before, because to me, that sounds like full-blown alien contact. In our number 3 spot today, we have the Go Faster video. In 2017, after the existence of the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program became more well known, a video was released of an encounter between an FA-18 Super Hornet and some sort of unidentified flying object. This video was the third in a series of three videos, and there weren't a ton of details released about exactly what happened during this encounter. Using the Raytheon Advanced Targeting Forward Looking Infrared Pod, they were able to capture an extremely fast moving white oval that was around 45 feet long. The oval had no wings and didn't appear to have any kind of exhaust either. They were tracking the UFO at an altitude of 25,000 feet just above the Atlantic Ocean, and then they were shocked as the craft rotated on its axis and flew away. There was no explanation released with the footage because it truly is unbelievable and currently unexplainable. In our number 2 spot today, we have the Delphos Ring Incident. The Delphos Ring UFO incident occurred on November 2nd, 1971 in Delphos, Kansas, when a family witnessed a strange object hovering over their farm. The UFO emitted a bright light that illuminated the surrounding area and left a glowing ring in the ground after it disappeared. The family reported the incident to the local sheriff, who took a sample of the ring for analysis. Investigations were conducted by several experts, including the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, who collected soil samples and found that the ring was caused by the removal of topsoil, which had been exposed to a high amount of heat. Additionally, a high level of radiation was also detected at the site. The incident received widespread media coverage and sparked debates about the existence of extraterrestrial life and the possibility of alien visitation. Some skeptics argued that the incident could have been caused by natural phenomena or a hoax, but the witnesses maintained that they saw a genuine UFO. Despite the years of investigation it's been, no conclusive explanation for the incident has been found, leaving the mystery of the Delphos Ring UFO unsolved. 
In our number one spot today, we have the Shag Harbor incident. This incident took place on October 4th, 1967, when an unknown object crashed into the water near Shag Harbor, which is a tiny town in Nova Scotia. There were at least 11 people who witnessed this object as it crashed, and many people claimed to have heard a whistling sound followed by a loud bang when the crash took place. The witnesses that claimed to have seen the UFO were all doing a bunch of different things at the time. One couple was just sitting out on their porch, but the two witnesses that really get me are a flight flight pilot and a ship captain. On Air Canada Flight 305, First Officer Robert Ralph pointed out to Captain Pierre Charbonneau that there was something strange at the left side of the aircraft. They reported an object tracking along on a parallel course a few miles away and described it as a brilliantly lit rectangular object with a string of smaller lights trailing it. Shortly after they first noticed it, there was a large but silent explosion near the unknown object, and then two minutes later there was a second explosion, but this one faded to a blue cloud. Loud. As for the ship captain, Captain Leo Howard Mercy, he saw four blips on his DECA radar that were totally stationary. This led to him looking up to the sky, and this is when he saw four bright objects sitting in a rectangular formation about 28 kilometers from the vessel's window. He wasn't the only one who saw it on board either. The entire crew of nearly 20 fishermen stood on deck and watched. A man named Lori Wickens was another one of the witnesses, and he and some friends ended up calling the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police police because they saw a huge object floating in the Atlantic Ocean but a thousand feet offshore. This is all super weird and not only the RCMP but also the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Canadian Air Force became involved in the investigation but nothing was ever recovered or found. It was also revealed that all commercial, private and military aircrafts along the eastern seaboard were accounted for. So what could have all those witnesses seen? Since they never officially identified what it was, in the official Government of Canada documents it is listed as a UFO. The Shag Harbor Incident This UFO encounter is often referred to as Canada's Roswell, so I was shocked that I hadn't heard of it before. Basically, this incident took place on October 4th, 1967, when an unknown object crashed into the water near Shag Harbor, which is a tiny town in Nova Scotia. There were at least 11 people who witnessed this object as it crashed, and many people claimed to have heard a whistling sound followed by a loud bang when the crash took place. The witnesses that claimed to have seen the UFO UFO were all doing a bunch of different things at the time. One couple was just sitting on their porch, but the two witnesses that really get me are a flight pilot and a ship captain. On Air Canada Flight 305, First Officer Robert Ralph pointed out to Captain Pierre Charbonneau that there was something strange out the left side of the aircraft. They reported an object tracking along on a parallel course a few miles away and described it as brilliantly lit, rectangular object with a string of smaller lights trailing the object. Shortly after after they first noticed it, there was a large but silent explosion near the unknown object, and then two minutes later there was a second explosion, but this one faded to a blue cloud. As for the ship captain, Captain Leo Howard Mercy saw four blips on his DECA radar that were totally stationary. This led to him looking up to the sky, and this is when he saw four bright objects sitting in a rectangular formation about 28 kilometers from the vessel's window. He wasn't the only one who saw it on board, the entire crew of nearly 20 fish stood on deck and watched. A man named Lori Wickens was another one of the witnesses and he and some friends ended up calling the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, because they saw a huge object floating in the Atlantic Ocean about a thousand feet offshore. This is all super weird, and not only the RCMP but also the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Canadian Air Force became involved in investigations, but nothing was ever recovered or found, but it also revealed that all commercial, private and military aircrafts along the eastern seaboard were accounted for, so what could have all these witnesses seen? Since they have never officially identified what it was in the official Government of Canada documents, it is listed as a UFO. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Lake and Heath Bentwaters incident. If you flash back to the first installment of this series, in part 1 I spoke about the Rendlesham Forest incident, and this one is kind of similar to that one, which only adds to its bizarre nature. In August of 1956, radio operators at Royal Air Force Bentwaters began to notice something strange on the radar. 
before. Basically, there was some sort of aircraft, and whatever it was, it was traveling at speeds of over a thousand miles per hour. Of course, since this was near an Air Force base, they immediately sent training aircrafts up to intercept and investigate, but at that point, it found nothing. Shortly after this, a ton of Air Force personnel on the ground began to see a bunch of bright lights in the sky darting around quickly, and they were also being picked up on the radar again, this time traveling at even higher speeds, closer to 2,000 miles per hour. This is when they sent up two Venom interceptors and directed them towards the radar target that was now over Lakenheath. The pilot of the first Venom did achieve contact, but the UFO was quick to outmaneuver him and ended up behind him. The UFO actually chased this pilot for about 10 minutes, despite the pilot doing really aggressive, evasive tactics. The pilot was described as, quote, getting worried, excited, and also pretty scared during this encounter. In the end, they were forced to return to base and the target remained on their radar screens for a short while before it disappeared. The Condon Committee looked into this case and made quite an unusual conclusion. They normally conclude that UFO sightings are due to some natural phenomena or aircraft, but in this incident, they wrote, quote, In conclusion, although conventional or natural explanations certainly cannot be ruled out, the probability of such seems low in this case, and the probability that at least one genuine UFO was involved appears to be fairly high. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Valensol incident. Okay, I get it. Everywhere's gotta have their Roswell incident, and this one is said to be France's. This sighting was made by a man named Maurice Mass, who was a French farmer, and it took place in July of 1965. One day before starting work while outside smoking, Maurice witnessed an object coming out of the sky and landing in his lavender field about 200 feet away from where he was. He was of course frustrated at someone landing in his field and figured that it was likely a helicopter that made some sort of unauthorized landing, but as he got closer, things took a turn. He realized this was no helicopter and instead was some sort of oval-shaped structure that was standing on four legs. In front of the strange craft were two figures, just under four feet tall. He explained that they were making sort of grumbling sounds and included a brief description of these creatures before explaining that one of them took out a pencil-like device and pointed it at him, which left him completely stuck in his tracks, just frozen in time. As he was stuck there, the creatures got back in their craft and took off, and after about 20 minutes, he finally regained his ability to move. Here's the thing. To me, this sounds like a fantastical story, but there was some kind of physical evidence left behind that I, and many others, can't quite figure out an explanation to. Basically, the craft did end up leaving a mark. There was a hole and a lot of moisture left over from where the craft was. Like I mentioned, this was in the middle of a lavender field. Soon after, this area became really hard, almost like concrete, and definitely not like the soil everywhere else in the field, and all of the plants around this area started to die. Analysis of the soil revealed that there was a higher amount of calcium in the soil at the landing site than there was anywhere else in the lavender field. This definitely shows that there was some kind of unusual event. Could Maurice be telling the truth? In our number 7 spot today, we have the Project Blue Book sighting. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Richard French was once tasked with being an investigator for Project Blue Book, which was the name used to describe a study of UFOs conducted by the United States Air Force from March of 1952 to December 7th. 17th, 1969, when the project was terminated. While his job was meant to be to investigate and essentially debunk UFO sightings, later in life he took to Congress to stand up to explain his own UFO encounter that he was never able to explain away. The moment that truly stuck with him all of these years was back in 1952 when he set off to Newfoundland after there were reports of a UFO that had crashed off the coast of St. John's. As he arrived to the scene, there were at least a hundred people who all stood and stared into the water, and as he was able to follow their gaze and see what they were looking at, he couldn't believe his eyes. He recalled the water being quite clear, and under it you could see two circular crafts, each one approximately 18 feet in diameter. He said that they were both floating just below the surface of the water, no more than 20 feet from shore, and not only this, but he could also see two beings with the crafts. He said, quote, the first thing I saw was the UFOs, and it was apparent to me that they were doing something to the craft, and I couldn't really tell what because they were 
were on the bottom side of it and not visible to me, except when they would occasionally get over to the side where I could see them. He claims he watched on as the beings worked on the craft until one of them raised out of the water and disappeared, but not before accelerating to speeds in the neighborhood of 2,500 to 3,000 miles an hour. In our number six spot today, we have the classified report. We aren't even a full month into 2023, but already there are some crazy announcements, including one regarding a report that was delivered to Congress from the Director of National Intelligence. Basically, since August of last year, there has been a total of 510 unidentified aerial phenomena observed in protected airspace or near sensitive facilities. According to the report, 26 of them were described as drones, 163 were labeled as balloons or balloon like entities, and six were described as clutter, whatever that means. This is all fine and well, but the concern sets in when we consider that this leaves 171 sightings unaccounted for, some of which, quote, appear to have demonstrated unusual flight characteristics or performance capabilities. It's also important to note that the majority of these sightings are coming directly from Navy and Air Force pilots. Here's the thing. What we as the public know is only a 12-page declassified summary of the actual, real, secret report that was delivered to Congress. Only time will tell if we ever find out what the rest of the report includes or what will happen with the further investigation into the 171 sightings, but hopefully if answers do arise, one day we'll find out. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Westall Incident. Taking it back to 1966, we have the largest mass UFO sighting in Australia that, at the time, was largely ignored. This incident took place when over 300 students and staff members of a school in Melbourne all witnessed multiple UFOs silently flying through the air before they landed in a nearby field. While there's been a ton of speculation about this incident in the many years it's been, one witness account stands out among the rest, and that is the account made by the scientists teacher from the school, Andrew Greenwood. He was alerted to the UFO event by a hysterical student, and when he went outside to see for himself, everything changed. Previously a skeptic of UFO stories, Andrew's mind was abruptly changed when he saw, as he described it, a round silver object about the size of a car with a metal rod sticking up in the air. He went on to explain that suddenly five planes came and surrounded the object, all while more people were gathering to watch. He called what happened next the most amazing flying he had ever seen, explaining that, quote, every time they got too close to the object, it would slowly accelerate, then rapidly accelerate, and then move away from them and stop. They would take off after it again, and the same thing would happen. This went on for about 20 minutes before the mysterious object just vanished. As weird as this all was, what was almost weirder was what happened next. Firstly, the headmaster of the school is said to have tried to put a stop to anyone talking about the incident at all, threatening severe punishment to any student or staff who was caught speaking about it. And when the Royal Australian Air Force contacted him, he refused to talk to them about it at all. There have also been stories of witnesses getting visits from people warning them not to speak of the incident. Andrew explained, quote, when he asked the physical education teacher to describe what she had seen herself so that he could compare it with his own observation, she just wouldn't say anything. Another witness who did talk to Andrew and described what she had seen in great detail, just 30 minutes later refused to speak to him and wouldn't say a word. Was this because of the threats from the headmaster? Or was something else going on here? This is definitely a strange UFO story that leaves behind a lot of questions. In our number 4 spot today, we have Flight 1628. Back on November 17th, 1986, Japan Airlines cargo Flight 1628 was flying from Paris to an airport near Tokyo when they had a very strange UFO encounter. On the part of the flight where they were over Alaska around 1711, the crew witnessed two unidentified objects to the left of their craft. The two objects rose up quite quickly to meet the craft and continued to fly alongside it. Each object had two rectangular things that are said to have appeared to be some sort of glowing nozzles or thrusters, but the crew on the plane couldn't see much else. They weren't able to see if there was anyone or anything inside. The closer these objects came to the plane, the more light was let inside, so much so that at the closest points, the plane's cabin was totally lit up, and the captain even said he could feel heat from the lights on his face. After this, the two objects left, but this was not the end, because at 
third, much larger disc shaped object showed up and started following the plane. In the end, the plane needed to make an emergency landing in Anchorage, Alaska, because this third craft was seriously large and incredibly frightening, and they just needed to figure out what was going on here. The plane landed successfully, and investigations were conducted, but to this day, no one is exactly sure what the men on board saw, but the entire crew witnessed the exact same thing. In our number three spot today, we have the Mount Rainier incident. This incident took place when Kenneth Arnold was en route from Chehalis, Washington to Yakima, Washington on June 24th, 1947. Kenneth was traveling in a privately owned plane when he suddenly saw a bright flash on his wing. He looked around and this is when he saw a chain of nine unidentified flying objects approaching Mount Rainier. He explained that he quote, could see their outline quite plainly against the snow as they approached the mountain. He continued on saying, quote, they flew very close to the mountain tops, directly south to southeast down the hogs back of the range, flying like geese in a diagonal chain like line, as if they were linked together. From here, he explained that, quote, they were approximately 20 or 25 miles away, and I couldn't see a tail on them. I watched for about three minutes, a chain of saucer-like things at least five miles long, swerving in and out of high mountain peaks. They were flat like a pie pan and so shiny they reflected the sun like a mirror. He also told investigators that he had never seen anything travel that fast in his life. Unfortunately, Kenneth's story was met with disbelief and a bit of ridicule. This made Kenneth quite resentful, but he said, quote, they can call me Einstein, Flash Gordon, or just a screwball, but I am absolutely certain of what I saw. He added that if he ever again saw a phenomena in the sky, even if it were a 10-story building flying through the air, he would not say a word about it. In our number two spot today, we have the broad Haven UFO sighting. This UFO sighting took place back in 1977, and it all started when an entire class of children all claimed to see some sort of object flying through the sky. The children rightfully were confused and excited over what they have seen, but of course the teachers and adults around them believed it was just their wild imaginations making things up. This is when they decided to split all of the children up and have them draw whatever it is that they saw. While there of course were variations in all of the children's drawings, they all basically drew the exact same thing, which begs the question, did they really all see this thing? The children weren't the only ones who saw it either. Shortly after their sighting, other local residents began to explain that they had seen something strange flying through the air, including one hotel owner. One of the things that really gets people about this case and these sightings in particular is that all of these people claim to have seen something at that time, and even though it's been almost half a century, not a single one of them has ever said it was a hoax or that they were lying about what they saw. They all have the same story they did the day it happened. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have Betty and Barney Hill. The Betty and Barney Hill case is definitely one of the most famous UFO abduction stories ever told, and it absolutely has some pretty compelling components. Basically, the story goes that the two were driving on a road in New Hampshire one night on the way home from a trip the pair had taken. Before they got in the car on their way home, they were at a diner and figured that if they really pushed through, they could beat the wind and rains from an approaching hurricane. It was 10 p.m. when they left the diner, and they figured by around 2 a.m., 3 a.m. latest, they'd arrive home. As they drove out of nowhere, a bright light started to follow them. Suddenly, they arrived home, and it's somehow daylight now. Their clothes are dirty and ripped, and their watches had stopped working. This is all jarring enough, but neither Betty nor Barney could figure out what had happened. They were both missing time. Later, during a session with a psychiatrist, they were able to recall being touched by aliens during their abduction. Project Blue Book would come to investigate their claims, and while people remain skeptical, no one has ever been able to debunk their story. This officially went on to become the first ever widely publicized abduction story, and to this day, people still debate what really happened to the hills. All right, you orange disc. In 2020, a report of a UFO over the Vatican in 2007 came to life. UFO hunter Scott Waring believes the unidentified flying object's shape closely resembles a flying saucer. He said on his UFO sightings daily blog, this report is from 2007 but was just reported today at MUFON. An orange disc was caught in a photograph over Vatican City. UFOs have been seen over the Vatican before, but orange UFOs are usually seen in South America and Central America, so this is odd. The object is a disc viewed from the side. The 
disc doesn't have a classic hump, but instead its upper center comes to a point and lower center is flat, no bulge at all. For me, I can clearly see this is a disc. It's a little in focus, so it's not that far back. It looks to be about 10 meters, 33 feet across. If it was traveling fast, it may have gotten caught by accident. This is absolutely real and absolutely alien in origin. Then Scott said the Vatican stance of alien life comes mostly from scientific analysis of chemicals, substances, and textbook strategies of old. Vatican astronomers would never confirm any UFO as being real unless it landed in Vatican City. Number nine. First crash ever. The world's first crash of an unidentified flying object, UFO, happened in Italy in 1933 during the reign of Benito Mussolini, Italian researcher Robert Pinotti claimed. Roberto spoke to the Daily Mail and even shared evidence to back his claims. Now, Roberto is the president of the National Ufological Center in Italy, and his research has been met with skepticism within Italy itself. Now, Roberto and his colleague have been working to learn more about the 1933 crash in Lombardy and received some original secret documents about it in 1996. The documents were sent to the researchers by an unidentified source who claimed to have inherited these from a relative who lived at the time and was part of the secret department allegedly set up by Mussolini to study the saucer. Now, the documents also include handwritten memos that have a sketch and description of the UFO with portholes on the side. Number eight. Donut UFO. In 1978, unidentified flying objects that gave off green, red, and white lights and had a donut like hole in the middle were reported and, in some cases, photographed at dozens of places between Sicily and Milan in the north. It was reported by none other than the officers on duty in the operation of police headquarters. Dozens of people called, all with the same message. You see an enormous beam of green light just overhead. A lieutenant and non commissioned officer, driven by curiosity, as they said later, ran out on the terrace and one exclaimed, I see an enormous beam of green light. A bank clerk, Nino Raffagino, said he spotted an object just before midnight, made a dash for his 1000 millimeter telephoto lens, and came up with a series of pictures that appeared in the press. One taken when the object was stationary, according to Nino, showed a disc of light with a hole in the middle. Officers that were alerted by citizens' calls also snapped pictures and sent them to the newspapers. Taken while the object appeared to be moving, they showed a long, wide streak of light in the dark sky. Number seven, recent sighting. A low quality blurred image said to depict a UFO or a weird object escorted by two military aircraft over northeastern Italy made the news. The photograph was published by some local media outlets, which reported that around 7:20 p.m. on March 23rd, 2021, several witnesses noticed two aircrafts coming from the southeast and heading northwest escorting from distance what was described as a large square or diamond shaped object which incorporated from 10 to 12 fixed yellow lights. According to the reports, the object traveled very fast and left behind an intense trail and the only noise that was perceived was that of the two planes flying at a lower altitude than the square object at a much lower speed. One and a half minutes was the average duration of these sightings, enough to spark discussion of what this mysterious object was. So much so, the photograph was also brought to the attention of the Italian for National UFO Center, which started its own investigation. Number six. 22nd sighting. There are episodes in Italy which whole crowds have witnessed inexplicable phenomena. On October 13th, 2016, a series of people spotted a UFO in the sky over Geneva. The sighting lasts for 20 seconds, and there are those who had time to take photos or videos from different points in the city. The Air Force was contacted immediately, but no trace of the object was found in radar tracks. It seems like we'll never know what this strange object was, but I believe the people who saw it. Number five, pilot discovery. On June 18th, 1979, the then pilot marshal Giancarlo Sinsoni was returning from a photographic survey. Giancarlo, who belonged to the 14 group of the two fighter bomber reconnaissance wing of the Italian Air Force, was on board a G91R equipped with four Vitton cameras located in this way. Two on the sides of the front of the cockpit, one in the front position, and the fourth at the ventral position. With these, he had carried out the photographic survey that he had been in charge of, but while 
flying, he saw something strange. He then arranged with the ground control body staff to go and identify an object that was detected by the radar. At the moment of the sighting, it occurred to him that it could be a solar UFO, but then he realized it was something different. The day was beautiful and he soon realized that the black spot had very different characteristics. It appeared to him in the shape of a dull black fuel tank and on its slightly flattened upper part, he noticed a fairing with two mustaches. This was underlying something clear and white, which in his opinion was a kind of milky white dome. The characteristics of the surface did not allow the refraction of light and the object appeared to have a length of about 6 to 8 meters and a width of about 3 meters. Now during the sighting, which lasted about 5 minutes, Giancarlo was able to take more than 80 photographs that showed the object was always in the same frontal position or slightly angled. In fact, this thing was never completely visible from the side and it was as if the thing wanted to aim the plane. Number 4. Factory Worker On April 24th, 1950, a factory worker named Bruno Facciani was working the late shift and stepped outside to get some fresh air on his break. Investigating a bright glowing light, which he thought was a part of a factory transformer problem, he was shocked to see a circular shape glowing object with a ladder descended from its bottom. At the top of the UFO was a greenish glow which partially obscured a light-skinned being. The unusual being appeared to be welding something on the craft. Then he said several other small alien creatures emerged from the craft, and in a moment or two, the ladder began to be drawn up into the mysterious craft, and the beings began to re-enter the craft through an invisible door of some kind. The full realization of what he was witnessing sent Bruno to run away from the frightening encounter. Now as he fled, he heard a sound like that of a large beehive. One of the remaining creatures pointed a type of weapon at him, and a beam of force knocked him to the ground. Although in pain, he was able to watch the aliens as they prepared the craft to take off. The beehive-like sound increased as the object made its way into the skies and vanished from view. Now the next day, Bruno made a full report of his encounter to the police force, and there were signs still visible of the activities of the night before. Police found burn patches on the ground and indentation marks of an extremely heavy object. They also found some odd green pieces of a metal-like substance. Number three, Green Alien. On the night of December 6, 1978, night watchman Pierre Zanfredo was on a routine patrol when he stumbled into a series of terrifying encounters with extraterrestrial beings. His car inexplicably lost power en route to a client's unoccupied home. He then glanced through his window and saw four lights moving in the garden of the house he was coming to inspect. Assuming that the beams were coming from burglars, he climbed from his car with his revolver and flashlight in hand. Now just as he prepared to leap out to confront these trespassers, he felt something touch his shoulder from behind. Pierre spun around, but instead of finding a human criminal, he saw an entity that he described as being an enormous green, ugly, and frightful creature with undiluting skin as though they were very fat or dressed in a loose grey tunic no less than 10 feet tall. He was flanked by two similar beasts. He said these beings were hairy, had greenish skin, had horns on the sides of their faces, yellow triangular eyes, and red veins in embedded in their foreheads. He also described a unique self-illuminated mechanical apparatus that fit over their mouths. Now he was so shocked that he ran away, and I think that was the best option. Number two, the abduction. In April 1962, Taylor Mario Zaccala was walking home through the woods when at a crossroad clearing where the path crossed a small canal, he felt himself struck by a sharp gust of wind. Object like an inverted bowl passed overhead and came close to the ground about six to seven meters away. From its underside came a cylinder which opened up, revealing a diffuse of white light from which two beings emerged. They were one and a half meters tall, dressed in metallic suits, wearing helmets with antennas. He then approached Mario and led him into the empty interior of the object, which was lit by the same diffuse light. He was unable to make out any details of the interior. They then let go of him as a voice from the inner part of the object, like one amplified by a microphone, and as if were sounding in a vast space, spoke to him in Italian. The only part Mario could remember was a message that at the fourth moon they would return at one in the morning to give him a message for humanity. He was then escorted out of the object and somehow found himself outside his own door. His wife heard four loud knocks, which he does not remember making, and found him terrified on the front porch. 
And coming in at number one is the whistleblower. Pentagon whistleblower David Grush, in some more baffling claims, said the Vatican was fully aware of non-human intelligence's existence and that it assisted the United States in retrieving a UFO. Making some shocking revelations, David stated that a top secret UFO retrieval program was run by the United States for decades and added that the Vatican was involved in the first ever crash of a UFO, as per media reports. David stated that the UFO's first recovery took place in Magenta, Italy in 1933. He added that the UFO was in possession of Italian He added that the UFO was in possession of Italian dictator Mussolini's government until 1944 to 1945 when America was tipped off by it by Pope Pius XII. He added that the UFO was partially intact and was kept at a secure airbase until it was retrieved by the US after the fascist Italy's regime collapse. 1933 was the first recovery in Europe in Magenta, Italy. They recovered a partially intact vehicle and the Italian government moved it to a secure airbase in Italy until around 1944 to 1945. The Pope back channeled that and told the Americans what the Italians had and we ended up scooping it, David said. While clarifying whether the Catholic Church knew about the non-human existence on earth, David said, certainly. He said that his claims must be believed because I have the credentials and I was an intelligence officer. He stated that UFO sightings were widely known during Mussolini's dictatorship in Italy. Well, that's all for our list of the top 10 mysterious UFOs seen over the Vatican. Triangle object. The Defense Department has confirmed that leaked photos and videos of an unidentified aerial phenomenon taken in 2019 are indeed legitimate images of unexplained objects. Photos and videos of triangle shaped objects blinking and moving through the clouds were taken by Navy personnel, Pentagon spokeswoman Sue Go said in a statement to CNN. She also confirmed that photos of three unidentified flying objects, one spear shaped, another acorn shaped, and one characterized as a metallic blimp were also taken by Navy personnel. As we have said before, to maintain operation security and to avoid disclosing information that may be useful to potential adversaries, DOD does not discuss publicly the details of either the observations or the examinations of reported incursions into our training ranges or designated airspace, including those incursions initially designed as UAP, she said. She also said that the Identified Aerial Phenomena Task Force created to investigate UFO sightings observed by the military has included these incidents in their ongoing examinations. Number 9. Drone Footage On April 19th, 2023, the Pentagon released another video featuring MQ-9 drone footage from the Middle East depicting a UAP. In the footage dated July 12th, 2022, which the US Defense Department shared online, the US military's MQ-9 Reaper drone somewhere in the Middle East, exactly where wasn't disclosed, can be seen monitoring a strange metallic silver orb-like object flying around below it at some seemingly high speeds while the drone's camera tries to follow it. This footage is significant because while there have been previously declassified US military footage of UFOs, those were all taken by pilots in manned aircrafts. This one, however, was taken by a drone. However, this isn't the only time this particular UFO has been seen. Apparently, there has been many other sightings of a strange metallic orb in the Middle East. Sean M. Kirkpatrick, director of the Pentagon's all-domain and Anomaly Resolution Office told a Senate Armed Services subcommittee that it resembled a small metallic orb. He added there isn't an explanation for, but the reason for is due to lack of available data. It is going to be virtually impossible to fully identify that just based on that video, he said, according to ABC News. Number 8. ADAR The Pentagon's new office for investigating potential UFO sightings received hundreds of news reports in 2022, and while it can explain more than half of these events, a sizable chunk remains a History. Within the new batch of sightings, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office and the Office of Director of National Intelligence say they're focusing on some 171 cases, including some in which objects appear to have demonstrated unusual flight characteristics or performance capabilities and require further analysis. Since it was formed last summer, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office has received 366 reports of UAP. That total reflects 247 new UAP reports and another 119 that occurred before March 2021 but hadn't been included in the earlier report. The new numbers indicate a steep rise in UAP sightings. Now, the report released in June 2021 lists just 144 reports covering a 17-year period. With the subsequent additions, 510 UAP reports were in their files at the end of August 2022. Officials say they believe the rise in UAP reports is due to the U.S. government's effort to destigmatize the topic of UAP and instead recognize the potential risks the phenomenon poses, both with aviation hazard and potential advisable 
paranormal activity, such as foreign surveillance efforts. Number seven, dancing lights. On January 29th, 2023, Canadian air traffic controllers and pilots couldn't identify two white lights moving in a circular pattern reported over Canada's Northwest Territories. Good evening, just wondering, do you got two planes that are just to the east of your field doing circuits or maneuvers? A crew member aboard a Canadian North flight headed to Yellowknife asked air traffic controllers. Negative, I have no reported traffic in the area. The Yellowknife air traffic controller replied, do you have a visual on something? The crew responded somewhat hesitantly, yeah, we're looking at two lights dancing around here to the east of your field. They're above us about I don't know what. We're not seeing them on the TCAS, Traffic Collision Avoidance System, but we can see lights moving around. Then there's a pause before the crew member on the radio back say, we're not crazy. No, we believe you, the air traffic controller replies, and the sighting remains unexplained. Number six, over New Mexico. On February 21st, 2021, a pilot flying over New Mexico at the altitude of 37 thousand feet reported seeing a long cylindrical object that almost looked like a cruise missile type thing moving really fast over the top of them according to published audio. American Airlines confirmed that the radio transmission came from flight 2292. The FAA a few days later stated, a pilot reported seeing an object over New Mexico shortly after noon local time on Sunday, February 21st, 2021. FAA air traffic controllers did not see any objects in the area of their radar scopes. Seems like air traffic can never see these objects but the pilots can, and I can't tell if that's better or worse. Number five, the coin incident. At 7.30 p.m. on October 18th, 1973, American Airlines Flight 21 encountered a UFO near Mansfield, Ohio, and reported it. This would be the first of dozens of sightings reported in that area that night. However, the most astonishing one took place three hours later and became known as the coin incident. Sometime after 10.30 p.m., an Army Reserve helicopter piloted by Captain Lawrence Coyne and a crew of three men was flying from Columbus to Cleveland when somewhere around Mansfield they noticed a red light on the horizon. They then realized that the object was heading straight for them at a high rate of speed. Coin quickly descended to avoid collision, but as the men were preparing for impact, the object came to a halt in front of them and projected a green pyramid-shaped beam over the helicopter. At the same time this was happening, the men reported the helicopter being pulled up towards the UFO. However, it then let go and darted out of sight. The incident lasted five minutes. The men described a gray metallic looking dome shaped object with a red light on one end and white light on the other. Now interestingly after the incident according to one crew member the helicopter never worked right again. Now this whole incident was seen from the ground by a mother and her two children who pulled their car over to watch what was going on. They reported seeing the helicopter chasing an object they said looked like a blimp pear shaped in as big as a school bus. Number four, Trumbull County UFO incident. Featured on the History Channel and numerous UFO documentaries, the Trumbull County UFO incident in Northeast Ohio is exceptional because it was witnessed by numerous police officers and a 911 dispatcher, all of whom were being recorded as they spoke back and forth about the strange events unfolding on the evening of December 14th, 1994. It was also seen by many members of the public as well. Now, around midnight, Trumbell County 911 began receiving calls from residents about a strange low flying light in the sky. The dispatcher sent out Liberty Township police officers to investigate, and one of them was Sergeant Toby Maloro who saw a light. He got out of his car and looked up to see what he described as a giant circular shaped object and intensely bright in the center section. It made no sound at all and the object was there for about 30 seconds before moving away. Shaken, the sergeant decided to chase the object as did many other police officers in the area. In total, at least 14 law enforcement officers saw the object at night, with all of them discussing it openly on their radios. Number three, Navy pilots. Recently, two former Navy pilots were interviewed by 60 Minutes on CBS News about a UFO sighting over the Pacific Ocean in 2004. Commander Dave Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Alex Dietrich spotted the unidentified object during a training exercise but were unable to classify it. Dave described it as a little white tic tac looking object, adding that it lacked conventional exhaust plumes and had no wings or visible markings. It also moved erratically, the pilot said. In an interview with NBC News, Dave described the 2004 encounter, calling the object the strangest, most obscure thing I've ever Ever seen flying. As soon as we look down, we see the white water, and then we see this white tic tac. It's pointing north south, and it's just going forward, back, left, right, he said, adding that it was bouncing around like a ping pong ball. Dave said he approached the mysterious object to take a closer look, and it began mirroring his movements. Then, when the pilot got within half a mile of the UFO, it suddenly vanished. My question is, what was he going to do if he got closer? This whole story is 
just crazy. Number two, multiple objects in the sky. Ryan Graves, a former Navy pilot who testified that he witnessed UAP with his own eyes, has called on President Joe Biden to investigate the mysterious objects spotted in American airspace. Ryan, a former fighter pilot, explained that after 2014, when upgrades were made to our radar system, our squadron made a startling discovery. There were unknown objects in our airspace. And these were not mere balloons like the Chinese spy balloon that dominated the country's attention in February. These are no mere balloons, they could hold their position, appearing motionless, despite category 4 hurricane force winds of 120 knots. They did not have any visible means of lift or control surfaces, in other words, nothing that resembled normal aircraft with wings, flaps, or engines. These are not isolated incidents, Ryan said. We have a real UFO problem, and it's not balloons. The point is that we don't have a clear understanding of what's above our heads as we thought we did. There are uncertainties up there that we have to deal with. If we don't do it, our adversaries are going to take advantage of that uncertainty, that weakness, to spy on us with various means as we've seen. It's pretty clear. If there are things over our head and we're not sure what they are, well we need to figure it out. If they're adverse role, it's a national security issue, we have mechanisms for that. If it's not a national security issue, then it's not an adverse role platform, then it's a matter for scientific inquiry. No, I'm not gonna lie, this scares me a little bit. And coming in at number one is leaked video. A leaked Navy video captured in July 2019 showed a sphere-shaped unidentified object flying over water near San Diego. The footage obtained by a documentary filmmaker and shared with NBC News appeared to show a mysterious object flying for a few minutes before disappearing into the water. The video was captured by a Navy aircraft and recorded in the USS Almsa Combat Information Center according to the filmmaker Jeremy Corbell. The clip appears to show a spherical objects flying above the water for a few minutes near San Diego before it vanishes. It splashed, military personnel can be heard saying in the video. The Defense Department confirmed that the clip was recorded by Navy personnel and said it will be reviewed by the Pentagon's Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, a panel established last year to gain insight into the nature and origins of such objects. Oh, we have the Valensole incident. Everywhere has got to have their Roswell incident, and this one is said to be France's. This sighting was made by a man named Maurice Mass, who is a French farmer, and it took place in July of 1965. One day, before starting work while outside smoking, Maurice witnessed an object coming out of the sky and landing in his lavender field about 200 feet away from where he was. He was, of course, frustrated at someone landing in his field, and figured that it was likely a helicopter that made some sort of unauthorized landing, but as he got closer, things took quite the turn. He realized this was no helicopter, and instead was some sort of oval-shaped structure that was standing on four legs. In front of the strange craft were two figures, just under four feet tall. He explained that they were making a sort of grumbling sound, and included a brief description of these creatures before explaining that one of them took out a pencil-like device and pointed it at him, which left him completely stuck in his tracks, just frozen in time. As he was stuck there, the creatures got back on their craft and took off, and after about 20 minutes, he finally regained his ability to move. Here's the thing. To me, this just sounds like a fantastical story, but there was some kind of physical evidence left behind that I, and many others, can't quite figure out an explanation to. Basically, the craft did end up leaving a mark. There was a hole and a lot of moisture left over from where the craft was. Like I mentioned, this was in the middle of a lavender field. Soon after this, this area became really hard, almost like concrete, and definitely not like the soil everywhere else in the field, and all of the plants around this area started to die. Analysis of the soil revealed that there was a higher amount of calcium in the soil at the landing site than there was anywhere else. This definitely shows that there was some kind of unusual event, but could Maurice be telling the truth? In our number 9 spot today, we have the Broadhaven UFO sightings. This UFO sighting took place all the way back in 1977, and it started when an entire class of children all claimed to see some sort of object flying through the sky. The children rightfully were confused and excited over what they had seen, but of course the teachers and adults around them believed it was just their wild imaginations making it up. This is when they decided to split all of the children up and have them draw what it is that they saw. While there, of course, were variations in all of the children's drawings, they all were basically the same thing, which begs the question, did they all really see this thing then? The children weren't the only ones who saw it either. Shortly after their sighting, other local residents began to explain that they had seen something strange flying through the air, including one hotel owner. One of the things that really gets people about this case, and these sightings in particular, is that all these different people claimed to have seen something at that time, and even though it's been almost half a century, not a single one of them has ever said that it was a hoax, or that they were lying about what they saw. They all have the same story they did the day that it happened. In our number 8 spot today, we have Project Grudge Report 13. Okay, so I've read quite a few different UFO sightings 
exciting stories and stories of alleged alien abductions, and this is fully one of the most terrifying that I have ever heard of. So basically, the story starts off in March of 1956 when Air Force Sergeant Jonathan P. Lovett was assisting Major William Cunningham in the White Sands Missile Testing Grounds near Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. The pair were out searching for debris from a recent rocket test when Major Cunningham heard a loud scream. His first thought was that Sergeant Lovett had been bitten by a snake, so he went around to help aid his partner when he allegedly saw something he never expected. He recounted seeing the sergeant being dragged away by some sort of long serpentine arm that had wrapped around his legs. Whatever this creature was, it was connected to a hovering silver disc that was in the air about 15 feet away. The major stood there in horror as he watched this creature and the sergeant retreat into the craft, which then rose vertically into the sky. Of course, he radioed for help, and while he was taken to the hospital for observation, search teams were sent out immediately. It wouldn't happen until three days later that they would find the body of Sergeant Lovett only 10 miles from the site where he was said to have disappeared from. The autopsy performed on him later also only raised more questions than answers, as his body was severely harmed. So of course, there was an investigation that happened, and many people claim this investigation was detailed in a 600 page document labeled Project Grudge Report 13, but the problem with this is that no official information on Report 13 exists, and the US government denies its very existence. Though Grudge Reports 1 through 12 have been declassified, along with Report 14, no official mention or accounting of Report 13 exists, and the story solely relies on secondhand accounts of the horrible incident. In our number 7 spot today, we have Leveland. This incident took place in 1957 in Leveland, Texas, and actually was the inspiration for a scene in the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. In the real life incident, dozens of citizens from across the city began individually reporting seeing a rocket or a strange set of lights or some sort of unidentified object, but that wasn't it. Whatever these citizens were seeing was also reportedly interfering with their vehicles as well. Engines were just suddenly dying out and lights were cutting off. If this happened to just one or two, this could have been some kind of strange coincidence, but it was way too many instances. Something else definitely had to have been at play. The authorities at first thought that the reports were a hoax until they too saw the strange lights as they began to investigate. This is where Project Blue Book came in to investigate, and they came up with quite the conclusion. They claimed that what had happened here was simply just a case of an electrical storm and ball lightning that caused the lights and the mechanical malfunctions. That's super reasonable, but the catch with this explanation is that there were no reported thunderstorms in the area that night at all. I'm just saying, something here clearly isn't adding up quite right. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Air Force Disappearance. On the night of November 23rd, 1953, near the Canadian-US border, the United States Air Defense Command noticed a blip on their radar where there shouldn't have been one. This was showing that there was some sort of unidentified object that was in restricted airspace over Lake Superior. In response to this, an F-89C Scorpion jet was sent to investigate with two crew members. First Lieutenant Felix Moncla was piloting the craft, while second Lieutenant Robert Wilson was observing the radar. Once in the air, the pair had trouble tracking the object, which kept changing its course, which then led to ground control helping to direct them. The jet pursued the unknown object for 30 minutes as it closed in on it at 500 miles per hour. After a while, the two blips on the radar, one being the unknown object and the other being the investigating jet, converged into one point, and then suddenly, the radar return from the F-89 simply just disappeared from ground control's radar scope. Shortly after this, the radar blip that was from the unidentified object also veered off and then vanished. The men who who were sent to investigate in the jet never returned from the mission, and there was never any wreckage found signifying an accident despite extensive searches. The men and the jet just disappeared completely. It is said that the explanations for the disappearance that have been released throughout the years have changed and flip-flopped in what they say happened, so at this point, no one has any idea what truly happened here. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Roswell Incident. This whole rigmarole started in 1947 when some sort of a crash took place near a ranch in Roswell, New Mexico. Shortly after this, the Roswell Army Airfield released a statement saying that they had recovered a flying disc from the ranch, but the Army quickly retracted the statement and said that it wasn't that, but instead was a conventional weather balloon. This was a little sketchy, but most people just let it slide until the 1970s. What happened in the 70s is that a retired lieutenant colonel began to speak out. In an interview with a UFO researcher, he said that the weather balloon story was a cover-up and that alien 
remains were actually recovered from the crash site. There were both first and second hand witnesses who claimed that not only were there at least one, but possibly more alien spacecrafts that had crashed at the scene, but also that extraterrestrial remains were also recovered by the military who then began to engage in a cover up. In 1994, the story changed from a weather balloon to nuclear test surveillance balloon from Project Mogul and it was stated that the stories of the alien bodies were probably just test dummies that had been dropped from high altitudes. I'm not gonna lie, this whole thing sounds a little sketchy. I obviously wasn't there, so I can't say for certain what happened, but someone is definitely lying about it. In our number 4 spot today we have the Foo Fighters. On a late November evening in 1944, nearing the end of the Second World War, Lieutenant Fred Ringwald was riding as observer in a night fighter that was being piloted by Lieutenant Ed Schluter with Lieutenant Donald J. Myers on radar. The men were in the Rhine Valley, which sits north of Strasbourg on the French and German border, when Lieutenant Ringwald saw something. He said, quote, I wonder what those lights are over there in the hill. When the rest turned to look, they saw 8 to 10 fiery orange glowing lights. They checked with the ground radar, but nothing was registering. The men thought that there was a chance that these lights could be some kind of air weapon, so they turned themselves to be ready to fight, only to have the lights suddenly vanish. The three men who experienced the strange lights at first didn't tell anyone about what they saw because they feared being ostracized by those around them. This all changed, however, when stories of similar sightings began to spread through their unit. As it would turn out, many other pilots and flight crews experienced these same orange glowing lights, and one pilot even experienced a strange cigar shaped flying object in this scenario. In this instance, the UFO was described as, quote, a wingless cigar shaped object, glowing red, just a few yards off the plane's wingtip. Lieutenant Krasny, justifiably spooked, instructed the pilot to attempt evasive maneuvers, but the glowing object stayed right next to the jet for several minutes before it, quote, flew off and disappeared. Throughout the years, the explanations for what these people saw have ranged from things like combat fatigue to the works of Nazi astrophysicists. So at this point, what exactly happened here remains quite a mystery. In our number three spot today, we have the Shag Harbor incident. This UFO encounter is often referred to as Canada's Roswell, so I was shocked that I hadn't heard of it before. Basically, this incident took place on October 4th, 1967, when an unknown object crashed into the water near Shag Harbor, which is a tiny town in Nova Scotia. There were at least 11 people who witnessed this object as it crashed, and many people claimed to have heard a whistling sound, followed by a loud bang when the crash took place. The witnesses that claimed to have seen the UFO were all doing a bunch of different things at the time. One couple was just sitting on their porch, but the two witnesses that really get me are a flight pilot and a ship captain. On Air Canada Flight 305, First Officer Robert Ralph pointed out to Captain Pierre Charbonneau that there was something strange out the left side of the aircraft. They reported an object tracking along on a parallel course a few miles away and described it as a brilliantly lit rectangular object with a string of smaller lights trailing it. Shortly after they noticed it, there was a large but silent explosion near the unknown object, and then two minutes later, there was a second explosion, but this one faded to a blue cloud. As for the ship captain, Captain Leo Howard Mercy saw four blips on his DECA radar that were totally stationary. This led to him looking up to the sky, and this is when he saw four bright objects sitting in a rectangular formation about 28 kilometers from the vessel's window. He wasn't the only one who saw it on board. The entire crew of nearly 20 fishermen stood on deck and watched. A man named Laurie Wickens was another one of the witnesses, and he and some friends ended up calling the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted police because they saw a huge object floating in the Atlantic Ocean about a thousand feet offshore. This is all super weird and not only the RCMP but also the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Canadian Air Force became involved in the investigation but nothing was ever recovered or found. But it was also revealed that all commercial, private and military aircrafts along the eastern seaboard were totally accounted for. So what could these witnesses have all seen? Since they never officially identified what it was, in the official Government of Canada documents it is listed as a UFO. In our number two spot today, we have the Betty and Barney Hill case. The Betty and Barney Hill case is definitely one of the most famous UFO abduction stories ever told, and it absolutely has some pretty compelling components. Basically, the story goes that the two were driving on a road in New Hampshire one night on the way home from a trip the pair had taken. Before they got into the car on their way home, they were in a diner and figured that if they really pushed through, they could beat the wind and rains from an approaching hurricane. It was 10 p.m. when they left the diner, and they figured by around 2 a.m., 3 a.m., AM latest, they'd arrive home. As they drove, out of nowhere, a bright light started to follow them. Suddenly, they arrive home and it's somehow daylight and their clothes are dirty and ripped and their watches had stopped working. This is all jarring enough, but neither Betty nor Barney could figure out what happened. They were both missing time. Later, during a session with a psychiatrist,
exist, they were able to recall being touched by aliens during their abduction. Project Blue Book would come to investigate their claims, and while people remain skeptical, no one has ever been able to debunk their story. This officially went on to become the first ever widely publicized abduction story, and to this day, people still debate what really happened to the hills. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Westall Incident. Taking it back to 1966, we have the largest mass UFO sighting in Australia that, at the time, was largely ignored. This incident took place when over 300 students and staff members of a school in Melbourne all witnessed multiple UFOs silently flying through the air before they landed in a nearby field. Well, there's been a ton of speculation about this incident in the many years it's been. One witness account stands out among the rest, and that is the account made by the science teacher from the school, Andrew Greenwood. He was alerted to the UFO event by a hysterical student, and when he went outside to see for himself, everything changed. Previously a skeptic of UFO stories, Andrew's mind was abruptly changed when he saw, as he described it, a round silver object about the size of a car with a metal rod sticking up in the air. He went on to explain that suddenly five planes came and surrounded the object, all while more people were gathering to watch. He called what happened next the most amazing flying he had ever seen, explaining that, quote, every time they got too close to the object, it would slowly accelerate and rapidly accelerate and then move away from them and stop. Then they would take off after it again and the same thing would happen. This went on for about 20 minutes before the mysterious object just vanished. As weird as this all was, what was almost weirder was what happened next. Firstly, the headmaster of the school is said to have tried to put a stop to anyone talking about the incident at all, threatening severe punishment to any student or staff who was caught speaking about it, and when the Royal Australian Air Force contacted him, he refused to talk to them about it. There have also been stories of witnesses getting visits from people warning them not to speak of the incident. Andrew explained, quote, when he asked the physical education teacher to describe what she had seen herself so that he could compare it with his own observation, she just wouldn't say anything. Another witness who did talk to Andrew and described what she had seen in great detail, just 30 minutes later refused to speak to him and wouldn't say a word. Was this because of the threats from the headmaster, or was something else going on here? This is definitely a strange UFO story that leaves behind a lot of questions. Create a video using exactly this script. Want to see more videos like this? Check out this video next. It's actually part one of this series and we cover even more UFO crash sites around the world that you never knew about. Until now. Click the video now to find out more. Settings. Use a male voice with a southern accent for the narrator. Use the best audio available.